for mic line management, um, please use the front mic here. Um, I guess that's possible, and feel free, you know, move closer. Yeah, so I think they, they did the count based on the video codec discussion. <laughs> I, guess that was, I, don't, I don't know. Um, um, I get, we, have a, we have a note taker and we have a Jabber scribe, correct? You have two note takers and a Jabber scribe. Two note takers and a Jabber scribe. God, you guys are good. And um, <clears throat> the blue sheets are being distributed right now, so um, please sign them when they come by. Alrighty. doing that. Stop. So basically we had the things in blue up here, the things that we've got left, um, a little agenda bash. We have working group last call resolutions. It's basically all the security issues. So a little bit of, it's probably going to be like 20 minutes for us. And then we have three other drafts um, to discuss. And I guess, uh, Ted, you asked, you said we were going to swap some orders and now I can't remember what we were going to swap it to. I was suggesting we do a return before it. So we're, we're, there's a suggestion to do return before STP. Any objections? All right, cool. Cool. Um, anybody want to add anything else? All right. So without further ado, Martin is here, right? Excellent. I uploaded the version you sent me the link to, Martin. So I guess uh, basically what happened was we put the security arch drafts out of working group, out of the working group with the AD, and then we found some oops. We need to pull it back. So these are the beginnings of looking at them. I just want to point out also that Bernard took all of the open issues that he was aware of when he went through the list and put in the issue tracker. So the, the hope is that you know. So there's a whole bunch of things in the issue tracker on the at the IETF website related to the RTC web working group. So we can go through and like, yeah, we covered this. Yeah, we covered this, and just kind of knock them all out. Oh, I didn't. I didn't realize I was looking yeah, for that, that but that. Happened I looked for the emails. I think I got most of them. Right. Bernard, correct me if I miss anything, and we can we can go over over it quickly. Da, 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 da. Where the hell is it? Sorry, I apologize. That's return. That's this one. Got it in the browser? Yeah, hold on. As we all go through my email. Downloads. It's got to be that one, right? No, it's this one. Oh, yeah. I have just uploaded this, so it is actually on the meeting manager site. Yep. Okay, thanks, Martin. Next. Let's just. All right. So um, it was observed that we don't actually tell people what hash algorithm to use for the A equal fingerprint line. So I am going to suggest that we mandate the use of SHA 256. Uh, and allow people to use SHA-1 for the, for the near future, though uh, I r recommend that we get it in our heads that we're going to turn this off at some time in the, okay. in the near future. Uh, it's not quite as bad as uh, it might have been with, um, say, regular CA certs. Um, we're generating in these certificates and throwing them away on relatively short time scales and uh, they don't actually carry any significant um, credential weight. But um, I don't want SHA-1. So yeah, so, uh, yeah, go ahead, sorry, Bernard. Uh, yeah, so just to comment, my understanding is that existing implementations uh, generally offer SHA-256 but also could validate SHA-1 and SHA-512. I think. I believe that is correct. I think we might also accept uh, 384. Okay. I so, can't remember exactly. Yeah, if, if, if that's true or some subset of that's true, it might make sense to just say that is what people ought to do, like generate 256, but be able to validate the stuff that people could validate. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the May on SHA-1 is validation only, yes. Russ? That doesn't make any sense. If it's May only on the validation, uh, somebody's got to be producing it. Well, yeah, this, this would be WebRTC compatible devices, mm -hmm. so blah, 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 um, blah, blah. Anyway, that's not what I got up here to say. But, sure. Um, Russ Housley, Vigil Security. Um, rather than having to do this later document, why don't you say should not use SHA-1 after some date? Yeah, this is really different. 
We're only, I think we only really need to say validate in this context for SHA-1. So the way I read it, you're saying may do either now, yeah, sending uh, and validation. Is that not what you meant? Let, let's just strike sending for, for SHA-1. I don't think there's any case for a, a modern compliant WebRTC device to be sending a SHA-1 hash whoa, 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 just a second here. here. <laughs> yeah. That, that's oh, no, not you the can, question. You, well, you, well. Yeah. The, the, the question is what do all the legacy devices do, not what the browsers yeah. do. Well, that's, that's why I'm suggesting validation. Uh, the, the, sure. Let's get some, see if we can get some clarity out of this guy. This is like the worst document anybody's ever written. Like, like you really should be embarrassed at how, how crappy this document is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah. I, I, I take full it's responsibility. It's my document, right? I mean, like... Um, yeah, exactly. Um, so, I guess let's let's, let's let's just take a step back. Rather than being sort of boo hiss about the about the about the, about the, about the these these type, these digests, right? Let's take a step back and ask what we're trying to achieve. So, um, the if we're going to interoperate with older versions, we have to be able to at least for some reasonable period both accept and generate SHA one. Um, generate? Yeah, because 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 old. Because those things take SHA-1, right? Yeah, and then right. SHA-2 takes. And by the way, and by the way, like, yeah, I mean, they're probably going to require, by the way, some modification in the JavaScript to like strip out, probably strip out the SHA-2 takes. Because I bet people don't handle multiple fingerprints very well. Um, but that's at least a JavaScript fix, so no big deal, right? Um, yeah, that's probably right too, because um, the, because of what the 45, whatever it is, uh, 4572, yeah, so whatever we it is, that, it, that we screwed that. We screwed that one up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I'm trying to figure out what. The, um, you know, what what is the g given that there's like been like next to no progress on um, on pre on second pre image attacks on SHA one, like what's the rationale for like being all negative about SHA one right now? I think I think the concern here was um, simply a pre image attack, wasn't it? Right, but all, all the Wang work was was collisions. There's been. There's basically but a, no, a collision in this no context would, would, would be sufficient, wouldn't it? Huh? A collision would be sufficient. I d um, a collision in the full certificate, well, in it, so the self-signed certificates, right, a collision would not be sufficient because why would you, because because why would you generate two certificates with the same digest in different keys? How, why, what, what would be incentive to do that? So in order to have a collision, what you would need would be a context in which you were using a certificate. Well, well I mean, I mean, if, you, if you actually have the private key for the one that you generate a collision for. No, no, wait, wait, a, wait a second. The, in, so, in, so in this case, right, the person who's producing the fingerprint is the person who made the search, right? So a collision attack requires making two search with, making, making two search at the same time with the same fingerprint, right? And so um, since you're the person doing that, why would you produce one that to the collided? Right. Yep. So, um, so I mean, the, the only case I can think of that be relevant would be one in which someone, in which you were using third-party issued certs, and, you, and someone somehow convinced a third-party issued cert to give them to give them the same certificate that they gave somebody else. And I suppose that's possible, and I have trouble figuring out how, how that's likely to happen. Maybe I'm misanalyzing this, but I'm, I, I don't think I am. All right. Well, if you're going to do the must not later. I think you should pick your dates as opposed to saying, I'm going to redo the RFC. So uh, back to some of the logic that Eric was starting on, which is there's the stuff you have to be able to validate, right? And so the legacy guy's probably going to send you shell one, so you really must be able to validate that. Yeah. You, if we're going to say that SHA-256 is what you should use by default, you have to be able to validate that as well. Yes. And so the only remaining question is, should you force people to validate SHA-512 or should it, it should be something lower, right? Um, um, so that's validation. And then generation, Eric made the argument they should be able to generate SHA-1 and 256 because that's the preferred one. And I guess the only other question is, should you be able to generate 512? Right? Sort of like what's come up here and tell them exactly what to do. I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything we really need to say about it. additional uh, hashes in, in addition to these. You may generate them. You may validate them. At, at yeah, I, mean, I think I mean I think the 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 the, the minimum the, I think the minimum interoperability profile. Well, let's take a step back. The minimum interoperability profile for WebRTC should be SHA-256, and so 
Um, we absolutely should require every DoShot256 because that's what we want, and because someday we may have to turn off SHA-1. And that's generate and validate. Generate and validate, right. And, and, and in terms of the interoperability profile for older things, that's got to be SHA-1 for now, and I don't see how we can get around requiring that if we want it to work. Um, and so maybe in the future, SHA-1 will be really busted and we'll, we'll hopefully stop accepting it, but hopefully we'll have enough warning that, that people can upgrade their, their, their legacy endpoints. But I, I just, I'm just like, I would prefer it be shut days only, but I'm just not seeing how we do that in, the, in an environment with existing crap that does SHA-1. Um, I think the Cisco stuff does. Now maybe Cisco can change it. Okay. Um, I, I, we, we can check into what the status of that is. I don't know, but my guess as an individual contributor is, you know, expect the worst. And so I will say, yeah. if we could commit... If, I'm saying if we could convince ourselves that... If we convince ourselves that there was only a finite amount of legacy equipment and that that could somehow be fixed, um, you know, I'd be willing to commit to a schedule for deprecating SHA-1. But, I mean, I, I, again, like, absent any, uh, uh, again, may I misrepresent the research, but absent any evidence of, of, of a, a pre-image or an analysis of the collision is a problem in this case, I'm, I, like, I feel like maybe it's a little premature to be, like, trying to de deprecate SHA-1. All right. Uh, must on both, uh, I think we're getting to. John Thunick, so um, remind me, we deprecated the old rule that's used the same hash algorithm that the certificate itself uses? No one has deprecated that. So I wrote an internet draft on that, and yes, I was about to bring that point up. All right, uh, so I mean, do, do if we you have, have legacy equipment that actually does that... I mean, are there, in fact, um, rules about what hashes you can use in the DTLS certificates themselves? Because those should align, even if we're Correct. changing those. I believe, I believe that... The recommendation there applies also to the generation of the certificate. So it's so it's it's again um, interrupt with SHA one, but may but should but must SHA two fifty six for your own. Uh, I think I think for the purposes of this, we we're going to have to pick one because that's how certificates work, and we have chosen SHA two fifty six. If anyone out there is validating SHA one and uh, expects that to also be the same hash that's used in the generation, in the creation of the signature on the certificate, mm -hmm. um, boom, and I'm not going to be all that sad about that. Okay. So, okay. so we also have a draft that actually says it recommends not using SHA-1 in a signature-based algorithm. Yeah. So we'd have to, I mean, so in fingerprints, it's different between fingerprint and a, and a signature. So like would, would you expect that the, um, that a certificate was, that DTLS with the, if, if the peer presents a certificate, uh, with SHA-1 in the certificate, would you expect that to work or do you expect that to be rejected? We, we, we don't actually... Uh, okay, so just again, take a step back. The signature that's on the certificate that we present in here is completely immaterial. The only question is whether or not someone's actually doing unnecessary validation on that certificate and choking as a result of what it sees left right. or right. If there's MD2 in the certificate, I propose we accept it. Uh, so, so uh, I, I guess here, here's if we can, you know. If, sure. Here, here, here's, here's what I suggest we resolve this. Um, so, um, is it, um, I, I postulate that nobody, in fact, enforces this rule about the hash algorithm being the same. Yep. And so, unless somebody tells me, that, unless I hear pretty soon that they, that, that they, um, that, that some, that's not the case, I propose we simply remove the rule. And then, and that would leave you, so by the way, you still can, do, even, if, even if the rule remains, you have to generate multiple certificates. It'd just be a pain in the ass, right? Um, How do you know which one to send? Um, I would assume, no, no, the, the other side would have to match up against one of them, right? Yeah, but if you've got multiple certificates, you, you don't know which, that the other yeah, guy I, is I, not I, validating, the, has validated the certificate, you know? When, at the point that you, you're offering it in the DCLS handshake. But that's true in either case because of the, um, yeah. because, because of the EC, EC versus RSA issue. Well, we can use the EC RSA, uh, the Cypher Suite um, negotiation okay. to deal with the EC well, RSA you can one. Well, too, right? Um, uh, so, um, anyway, yes. sorry, let me move forward. I, I, propose that, I propose that we relax the restriction on having to, having to, have, different, having to have the same algorithm, and we, um, and we remain mostly silent about what the, what the, what the certificates should be signed with, um, but propose, I mean, I say propose to SHA-256, it should be, yep. but, but like, they, also you're not supposed to check it or something. Yep. Um, although maybe I'd be willing to say you should check it to be reasonably modern because like putting in like MD2 would not be really good. No, it's fine. It's just it's a public insecure, key container. It's kind of weird, right? Um, I mean, do what you want I don't think at that point. I don't think it's secure. Um, so, um, 
and you too may be insecure, but I don't think it's insecure in the context of the self-signed cert, which you're not checking. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but, um, and so, um, and, and, but then also say you must, you must do both SHA-256 and SHA-1 and call today. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So, so we're saying that you, you can send multiple A equals fingerprint in the same? You, uh, you, you, we'll, we'll have to. Okay. And we will have to do that. And, and we know that legacy could won't choke on that? Well, Sorry. We don't know that, but we're no. going to take a punt on that. I so assume it will, but my, that, that you can patch, we'll have to patch it up in JavaScript. Okay. We'll, 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 get, we'll take that gamble, I think, I, is, I the, like is a that. conclusion. I, mean, no, we're gonna, I mean, we're going to have to spend the next, you know, Google, Google and we are going to spend the next, like, like four months unwinding this, because I, I know we didn't take two fingerprints for a long time. I don't think you do either. I'm really confused. What, what DTLS SRTP legacy equipment? Eh. Okay. Here comes the uh, Cisco guy. <laughs> And uh, but also there's actually a lot of if you if you can't if the reason for the same hash rule is if you can't parse the hash uh, off of the certificate then you won't be able to use the certificate anyway. Why? No, it's just complicated. So that this is the logic of the same hash rule in SDP, right? You use the same hash to it, to generate the fingerprint in SDP as you did in the certificate itself. So you only need to know one hash function. If you can't read it out of the SDP, then you won't be able to understand it in the certificate anyway. That's all right. Cryptographically, it doesn't matter, but it means that you can't actually parse the certificate. You can't. You can't. All right, we got like six minutes left for this whole, all of this stuff. So. Uh, okay, look, I mean, we need to go play with this and test a little yeah. bit. Uh, Colin Jennings, sorry, as an individual contributor here. I, but, I mean, if we're going to break backwards compatibility with equipment that correctly implements the RFCs that we've published without believing that we need to go and update those RFCs to fix them, um, I'm going to complain. Like, the, for, for no security gain, that just doesn't sound right to me. So, I mean, let, let, I mean I'm game to fix this and make sure that we have it right, okay, whatever so, we should have so, done. But, so, to be I mean, clear, the reason, the primary reason we need multiple fingerprints is not for multiple hash algorithms, it's for multiple, it's for multiple public key signature algorithms. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so is there an update to the RFC? We, 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 will, we will take the action to do one. Yeah, okay, okay. so let, let's work through this and, okay. and, and figure it out. But this is sounding so like... I'm not gratuitously trying yeah. to break your equipment. Right. I, I, I'm willing to go to some effort not to. <laughs> Excellent, okay. And the only thing I would add about the SHA-1 is if we leave it in there, we need to put a consideration to say we're using it in a fingerprint purpose, so like, leave us alone, security guys. Right. So. Yeah, we'll, we, we will do that. Uh, and, and I do actually have a draft updating the A equal fingerprint doc that deals with the issue of hash agility and, and, and this certificate issue. So I can resurrect that and send it to the list if, if that's what people want. Okay. Right. So this one's fun. I can go through the long explanation on this one. Oh. Just follow the notes. No conclusions on this topic, right? Correct. Apart from the, uh, we will be going with must and much. And we'll, we'll, we'll work something out and send it to the list. There are a few of us who have the state in our heads. Okay. So, um, Magnus noted this, this issue. I don't know if Magnus was paying attention to the blogs and various other things at the time that um, he was away, but this turned out to be a bit of a hoo-ha on the, on the internet and people got really excited about, about this exact issue. And we have a bug that's quite kind of interesting to read. Um, feel free. Uh, Justin will probably have some view on this one. I've got the next slide, which is probably more interesting to people. So um, We closed this issue before. Um, uh, maybe we failed to document it. Maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe that's an action that we have to take out of this. Um, notice my proposal doesn't actually suggest that we do nothing. Um, the concern arises, out of, arises from t out of two things. Uh, people are concerned that if they're using a VPN for privacy purposes, we're like spraying their IP addresses all over the internet. Um, and it exposes land topology even for users who aren't concerned about using these VPN devices. Uh, the concern is that the browsers are unable to properly distinguish between what is uh, a network where the topology should be hidden and a network that where the topology is simply, you know, how the topology is. And um, people who are on, say, a, a normal VPN really do want in a lot of situations to be able to use their local network to make their phone calls and, and whatnot. 
and don't want to pay the price of tromboning the, all of their media traffic all the way back, back home. So we have a problem. Uh, and the other, the other point here that has been made a number of, point, uh, number of times that people seem to uh, not appreciate very well is if you actually care about your privacy, you actually have to take uh, considerably more steps than just turning on a VPN. Uh, people don't realize this. Um, but you know, when, when people ship Tor, they turn off things like WebRTC, right? Uh, because they understand exactly this sort of... And, and they turn off JavaScript. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of things... Uh, are needed in order to get proper privacy protection for these things. And, and my proposal here was to leave this to the browsers and Magnus notes that we should probably document the fact that we are doing so. Justin. So um, I think the thing that we missed in the first go round on this, and at least I missed, is uh, you know we all kind of knew that the local addresses would be surfaced to the browser. But I wasn't aware of the fact that if you're in a multi-home case or like, you, know, you have multiple active routes, that you can actually, you know, send stun out that second route. You know, the if you have a VPN tunnel, you know, you actually might have stuff going at the public IP stuff, and you might find out the public IP, which is dis distinct from the, uh, you know, the VPN IP, and that's what people really got upset about. And so right. the fact that you'd have like this multi-home uh, situation, uh, I think that's the thing that might be somewhat novel since the last time we talked about it. Now um, back to the, you know, the original part, like should we have turn only mode? Um, I don't think you have to go to that extremeness uh, because really the main thing you want to do is make sure that uh, nothing is surfaced to the outside other than what the you know, web server could already see. And so the, what we saw, what we did in Chrome to solve this was basically have a mode where when you bind, you don't bind to every interface, you just bind to the any address. And so you can still get stun candidates um, just fine. You can still get turn candidates just fine. But you don't have to limit yourself to just turn candidates. It's just uh, you don't give out any and local IPs and you don't give out anything else that wouldn't be found through going through the default route. And so what I would suggest with this document is that um, the solution that, you know, if people agree this is a good solution, we kind of document this as like, uh, you know, if, if, you know, there are trade-offs, but if this is something you want to sort of optimize for, this is the approach that we recommend. All right, so I just want to jump in. Uh, we have 20 minutes allotted for this. Um, we're going to keep going, though, and kind of shortchange the non-working group drafts at the end, because I think this is more important than we drive these home. So go ahead. Sorry, Harold. Hi, to all this, Jim. Just mentioned that in the reports I've seen, there's one single VPN product for the Mac that causes the, causes the local address to be revealed. I have not seen it happen with any, any other VPN setup. It's nice to be in a place where people don't uh, go in a wild panics about this. So I think, I think that, that Justin had the right take on this. That we are, um, So my, con my slightly more concrete version of Russ's proposal is we should document the state of play and document what you could do in order, in order if you wish to care about this and say, browsers may wish to supply some, mo some mode which you get into an unspecified way that, um, uh, th that, that behaves the way Justin just indicated. Um, um, that I realize that will not please all the people who wish we would, not, wish we would turn off WebRTC by default, but the people are not going to get what they want. Um, the um, one thing I would also mention, as Cullen mentioned this to me privately, is that um, most, my understanding is that, is that most organizations which care about security um, um, and run VPNs also strongly disencourage running these um, these dual home VPNs. And so we really ought to, I think, we, I mean, if we can find some guidance that says don't do that, like, that would be useful to put in the document to point to to say, like, this is, you know, the browser can help you out, but basically this is because your system is configured in a way we don't, we don't advise. Ted? Ted, Ted Hardy is an individual contributor. Um, I am generally okay with the idea of uh, making this uh, a, a descriptive text. I am concerned, however, and I don't care whether we deal with it here or in the uh, WebRTC context, um, about making this something that the user has to, to find the invisible control for on page three of the about colon Thing. And so I would suggest that as part of this text, we say, here are example cases where it should be the default. So if, for example, we believe that private browsing slash incognito mode or the related things is a place where this should be the default, that would be useful to do. 
Um, but if the chair wishes to tell me that I should take that to the w, W3C, um, I, I might, might agree. I, I think I could probably support that, that notion. I would just be I think I've just been a little careful about that. Um, you know, the, I think the notion of private browsing is that you leave no trace, not that you're not identified to websites. In fact, it even says something like that when you go into incognito mode. And uh, I, I just, you know, we shouldn't overstate kind of what incognito mode actually does. You're not invisible. Um, I, I think it's fine if you're using like Tor or something else where you're explicitly privacy preserving, but like, let's not overload the meaning of like uh, incognito. So, I mean, we sort of bandied about at one point actually suggesting a standardized affordance for the VPN to tell you, like, that you should kick yourself into this mode. Um, I don't think we should, I certainly don't think WebRTC should standardize that, 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 that sort of thing, but, like, if, if someone came up with some affordance for that that made some sense, I think we'd be willing to listen to it. Um, but I don't know what to do with that other than that, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know what it'd be, like the DHCP option, or you, you resolve am I in incognito mode that example that invalid or something. But not incognito mode, you know, in VPN, you know, hiding mode. Uh, Ted Hardy again. I, I, I understand the concern that uh, uh, Justin raises. I, however, I think that this actually um, is sort of the broad question of when somebody is making um, use of one of these and you have this sort of weird, um, you're, you're leaking things you would not necessarily expect. I mean, clearly when you're browsing, even in incognito mode, you know you are leaking the IP address from which you are browsing. That, that There's kind of no way around that, right? Leaking other addresses, some of which may um, give a great deal more information in, in this context, I think means that if we're not going to have a relatively clear affordance to say, here's how you turn this on, then we're going to have to infer it in some way. And if he's opposed to inferring it, fine, cool, then I think we should um, send a message over to our brethren in uh, WebRTC that we would like an affordance for this. So Colin Jones is an individual here. Um, I, uh, so first of all, I think this only happens in split tunnel VPNs, which are highly re not recommended by anyone who, for any reason, for the most part, right? So I, I, I think this is a, a corner case of we're trying now to patch up a bug that somebody else introduced. Um, and, you know, if that causes problems where you don't do it. The next thing I'd like to mention is that if you expect privacy, you're going to have to be running an application inside of your JavaScript here that is focused around providing you privacy. And that application can easily strip any addresses it feels are inappropriate. It could remove all but the turn addresses. So the application itself can do this. It's just not the browser is going to guarantee it for you at all. And I don't, I, I don't think this is what private browsing mode was, was meant for at all to respond to that. In fact, one of the you know, biggest use cases of WebRTC that's actively deployed today involves a, something that's mostly done in private browsing mode. Um, it, it, you know, this is these you web interface that. things. So, adult can't find it, <laughs> um, adult can't find it right. Um, so, I, and, and it's not, it, it, that's not linked to that type of privacy. So I just don't think I'd do that. The other thing I was gonna mention was to do with the default addresses. The default route often takes you out a interface that makes you very sad in many circumstances. So I, I would not be in favor of seeing an algorithm where you had multiple interfaces that were all live and you only use the, the one that had the default route because that's often not the one you want. Adam Roach, I'm going to ignore that because it's making my head hurt. I just wanted to... I wanted to agree with the assertion that private browsing mode doesn't mean this, but I wanted to add on that I think the real salient point here is up on the slide where we're pointing out that real privacy protection requires a lot more than just making sure people don't see your other IP address. And giving users the illusion that we're doing something magical by fixing this one tiny little aspect of protecting where they are in the network is doing them a disservice. You really need, I mean, if those people are concerned about that, you steer them towards something like Tor Browser that is going to sort of take care of all of that for them because having users try to piecemeal this together is giving them a gun without any instructions, not even telling them which end is dangerous and saying go. All right, we're going to give Joe the last word on this issue. Uh, just generally, I think that, you know, uh, I agree that we should have this not buried on page seven of the press. I think it should be like a top level privacy pref. I think it should be off by default. The optics of this are particularly bad. Um, you know, it makes WebRTC kind of it hurts the brand. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, making this have a standardized way to do it and making it uh, promote, prominent in press 
is a good way of doing it. Doing it in incognito mode, I, I don't think is a good idea because like the fact that you're going to be trombone routing when you're in incognito mode versus like in n normal browsing, that's hard to explain to people. Uh, those type of behavioral differences are not what one would expect. Um, yeah, that's it. John, thanks. First, uh, Colin, I was perplexed why you think that the default route doesn't work because I don't see how you reach the web page in the first place in that case. Through one of the other routes. Well, then we'll... Uh, yeah, okay. But that's not how TCP works. That's another issue. I, but anyway, so but I think, you know, I think, you know, also the, you know, the application can do it answer isn't the right answer because the, the uh, threat model here is the, the hostile JavaScript that calls create peer connect or calls create offer in order to enumerate your local IP addresses. It's not, this is not, you're trying to use an application that provides privacy. It's you're hitting some random web page that is choosing, that is using what the WebRTC APIs without your knowing they're doing anything WebRTC at all to enumerate your, your addresses. No. Let's, let's be clear. This is because people are using net, um, VPNs to, to get to Netflix and Netflix can now see where you actually are. Or, I mean, is, is there also the, you you hit you go to you know the China gov Chinese government site and therefore they see you're using a VPN to reach Facebook. I mean, Something like that. It's the same like threat that. model, right? Yeah. I don't know if we're doing it, but Joe Hall, CDT. Uh, I still don't fucking understand WebRTC. I'm sorry, so I'm going to say some naive stuff right here. Uh, I think what you're seeing in the internet wars on this particular topic are you can land on a page that has no indicia of being a, a signaling server, maybe that's what the right word or whatever, that throws some JavaScript that then exposes that. And you know, folks like us go to some great lengths to make sure the FBI has to do some pretty crazy stuff to get access to your, to, to local IP and stuff like that. So I don't know what to do about that and this may not be the place to do about, to do anything about it. But that's just the qualitative sort of. All right, guys, we've got two more issues, so. All right, good feedback. Next. Uh, Bernard, I think we should move on. Yeah. It's the right way to explain exactly what's going on here. It's kind of complicated. It depends on how the VPN sets the default routes, blah, 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 blah. Let's talk about it on the list. Let's have someone propose some, t some text and work from that. Okay. And musingly, Randall Jessup just did that in the Jabber. Ooh. Browsers should, capital, provide a way for users to suppress interfaces from being visible in WebRTC. The details are left up to the browser. That would be satisfactory to me. Was that satisfactory, Justin? I think you say what we recommend. Yeah, so, sorry, so, 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 so I think what, what let, me, let me try. Ju I think Justin described pretty accurately what you would do if you cared about this. And then we should say, describe that text, say, we don't recommend you use this kind of VPNs. With that said, browsers should probably no forward and do the thing Justin just said. Yeah, that's All right. I think I can produce that text to Someone, someone can produce that text, um, expanding on what Randall just shared, and we, we'll move on to. Oh, yeah, this one's easy. There's a bunch of Estes residue in the draft. We'll just remove it. Wired in. So, I think Magnus identified a couple, couple of points where it was just stuff that was obviously a holdover from the, from the time when we weren't certain about whether or not it was Estes or DTLS or Right. Easy. Next. Uh, yeah, something. I don't know, we can blame Kaufman for this. We still have to remove it. Next. That is it. That's it. All right. <laughs> so Bernard also submitted um, a bunch of issue trackers, Decker. So in the in the wiki, so that we probably. Need I went to back over the list. There there are a couple others. I don't know that we have to go through all of them, but um, basically there was one issue on uh, um, SRTP MKI. And I think everyone agreed that nobody's implementing this in WebRTC. Do not use. But yeah, it's I'm not in a draft, so we should yep. say that. Um, I think there was another one. Um, there were other ones about. Uh, oh, that's because there were on other oh, discussions. Um, yeah, Eric, Eric summarized what happens with respect to renegotiation and existing implementations. That ah. wasn't, never yes. made its way in. Do not use. Do not use. Um, I think there was uh, some questions, oh yeah, uh, about <clears throat> um, DTLS allows you to potentially reuse, set up one association and use it for both RTP and RTCP and the agreement was nobody does that either. Um, so that probably should be in there, don't do, do that. Do not use. <laughs> don't do that. Um, well, yeah, it would be like in the, in the non-MUX case yeah. trying to use one DTLS connection to key both and the answer is don't do that. 
but it is allowed in, in 5764, so there should be something yeah, that says don't do that. That's kind of crazy. Yeah, um, yeah it's in 5764. Anyway, uh, and then anyway, we, we can go through the, the other remaining ones. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think any of those sound controversial. If you think any, yeah, it was, any they were all just about just documenting what in fact everyone already does, but just yeah. shoving it in there so we can say, ha ha, don't do that. All right. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, people. Um, now we're going to move on to the uh, RTC transports draft. Here. Thank you for standing in the box, Martin. <laughs> it's such a long way. Okay, transport. I think this is very close to being finished, mainly because nobody, nobody is yelling at me about it, hardly. But there's been some changes in the last six months. And there are a couple of changes more that I want to make. I'm not uh, counting minor uh, textual clarifications that I'm just doing because Magnus reviewed the stuff. Thank you. And, but uh, th these are actual techn technical changes. Seven to eight. Next slide. HTTP proxy had the reference for HTTP connect saying, yeah, you should support this. Uh, dash 8 has instead a reference to draft ITF HTTP based channel protocol. That means that it should be shorter and clearer what it ex exactly it does. It also downgrades the requirement to a may with the, based on the discussion at the previous ITF that more or less said, said well, all the browsers are going to do it for commercial reasons, and, but we shouldn't force everyone to do it. So, may. But I messed up the edit. I lost a couple of references to, yes, you need to support proxy authentication. And I'll put those back in. So that should be uncontroversial, I think. Next slide. The one that I thought was controversial, but uh, wasn't, at least when on the mail list, was the bundling thing, which is that uh, if you're mandating something in uh, this document, then JSEP has to say how you signal doing that thing. And JSEP that says, that, says that balanced bundling mode is you propose one bundle that c can have everything in it, but you mark most of the stuff, mark the complicated stuff as uh, if you don't understand bundle, just don't look at this. So Transport 07 indicated that there's a mandatory configuration that says all the video is bundled in one transport, all the audio is bundled in another transport, and all the data is bundled somewhere else. Since JSEP doesn't offer a way to get there, we shouldn't make it mandatory. So I changed it. My name is Westland. <coughs> I mean, I, I, I do like that mode, actually, because I think it has some usage when you're trying to apply uh, flow-based QS on it. However, uh, and I think it's actually this decision here to make about, it's not about which spec you want to change. Do we actually want to specify in JSEP how you do it or are we removing it from transport? That's I think is a is more f fair description here. But um, yeah, so I mean I understand that as long as you have any multi-stream, if you remove this, we lose the capability of having multiple media streams or media sources being bundled together on one flow? No, we don't. We lose the ability per to... Per media type. The, per, by media type, yes. Yeah, yeah. Or we lose the ability to mandate that all browsers be able to do this. Yeah. The draft still says that it may do this. And the reason for the change was I raised this on the mailing list. I got 
comments from Ecker and from Justin saying that uh, this is the way they thought it should be. No other comments were received on the list, so I acted as I acted in the assumption that this represented the consensus. Uh, hmm. Jonathan, I mean, my impression was mostly from talking to Peter rather than actually reading it, is that they'll, the 1.1 1 1 .1 APIs will have APIs that can support multiple bundle groups. 1.0 will not, so defer to 1.1. .1. I think it's a useful feature, but not a, you know, a world-breaking feature if it's not present, so 1.1 .1 seems like a fine hmm. place to do it. I will not promise anything about 1.1. Uh, transport well, is controlled by JSEP, and JSEP is... Uh, uh, transport should be cons cons consistent with JSEP, and JSEP should, should be consistent with the API. I, that's the layering as I interpret it now. No promises for 1.1. Peter Thatcher. So there are two separate things here. One is what the policy does when, it, when you call create offer, what SDP it spits out. And the second thing is what SDP is allowed in set local and set remote. So if we allow multiple bundle groups in set remote, then you can still have bundled over uh, audio bundled over one transport and video bundled over another transport, regardless of the policy issue. So um, the real question is, what do we support multiple bundle groups or not, which is what we talked about yesterday. And it really doesn't have to do anything, have anything to do with um, the uh, the policy, because you can always do it e even if the policy doesn't uh, make it easy. So Colin Jennings, uh, I mean, my understanding is if we sent it, and this is building just what you said basically there, uh, what Peter said, uh, you know, if you get an offer coming in that supports multiple bundle groups, um, you know, bundle, supporting bundle requires you to be able to support that. And we would expect something reasonable to happen, including the possibility of negotiating all those. From a, so from a transport point of view, we can clearly have more than one bundle. Okay. Uh, the, this, the decision I heard in the room uh, yesterday when we discussed bundle was that uh, it was allowed, specifically on a question from our friends at Mozilla, to reject all but one bundle group. Uh, I'm happy with to revisit that one, but what? Yeah, except the M lines, but uh, except only one bundle group. Right. So I don't think there was ever a, a decision consensus on yesterday. That was where the discussion was going, which which seems to be a reasonable thing. But it would certainly also be possible for them. I, I thought we were discussing the other day for them too, when they got this offer in from some non-web RTC device that had multiple ones. They may reject all the bundles. They may except one of the bundles, they may accept more than one of the bundles, right? That's what, where it was the discussion. I think everybody was on at least agreement of that. There was disagreement of whether there was APIs that would cause you to create multiple bundles in a browser. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. leaving that issue alone right now because I don't think it has anything to do with transport. Yeah. But So I think transport certainly has to allow for more than one bundle. Yes, it's a, it's a SMA support. I mean, the, the, te the text says that you must support a mode where everything's bundled together, and you must support the mode where, where uh, nothing's bundled together, and you, and and that you may support other configurations. That's the current text. Okay. So, it, it, does that have any inconsistency with JSEP then? So the uh, the text now has no inconsistency with JSEP. It, it, the, text in, the, the text in version 7 had an inconsistency with the current text in JSEP. That's why, it, why I changed it. So, yeah, uh, Magnus Bösklund. Yeah, I, I'm fine with that as long as it's possible. And I think, but that possibility to some degree needs to be reflected up the stack also to some degree. Sufficient degree, I would say, that you actually have sh some chance of actually using this. I mean, yes, I can understand if some implementation at, at this point doesn't support it, but. So, so as, as, I, as I understand it, and Justin can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the JSET bundle processing rules mostly apply to the offer. So imagine, so if someone sent you, some non-JSET endpoint sent you a bundle um, offer that was, but that was done the way you suggest here, namely audio in one tranche, in one bundle group, and video in another bundle group. Um, you could accept that regardless of what the bundle policy you've been set for was, correct? 
because it only affects bundle only, not the bundle group assignments. And so the, I think that the, the so, so, so it certainly ought to be the case that browsers should be allowed to and encouraged to, in fact, accept those, accept those, accept those bundle group offers. Now, I'm not going to argue at what, what level 2119 order of strength it should be, but like, like, I consider it kind of a deficiency that we only accept the first one and we probably should get around to, to accepting more of them. Though it's, I don't know, it's, it's not a huge deficiency, right? Um, not a non-compliance, but a deficiency. Um, the relevant question for me is, um, should the, do, do we need the API surface for the offer to control bundle group assignment? And I think that's where we ran, a, ran aground the other day. And as I understood Cullen's argument, it was that the, um, that, that, that because bundle groups are tied to transport parameters and because so, and so are cost per settings, if you have differential cost settings, then you must have a necessity of different, to put differential bundle groups. Is that correct? I, and I, I don't know what I want to go into here, but yeah, I think that was, the, the, and I shouldn't have used cost, I should have used priority settings. The priority stuff that we're doing, that that API would, if you had some video at one priority level and some video at a different priority level, um, we have agreement in the working group to add that. We don't have a pull request because we were waiting for the doohickeys to get in first before we could send the pull request. It was one of the driving cases for adding the doohickeys. Um, you know, yes, we're going to have a pull request on that, right? No, we don't have that. So, so maybe we do want to take this separately, but um, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to put my head around it, the, this interaction because presumably, what would happen? I mean. If say we had a pull request for that, um, um, would I be able to fob the the priority settings after the connection was set up, and would that require any negotiation to debungle things? What would our set, set? I mean, say we have everything bungled into one group, and then I say, well, actually, audio should be really high and video should be really low. Does that mean I have to debundle and do a rehash to debundle, or would that be forbidden? And what's your thought on that? Uh, I was assuming that stuff was set when you added the tracks or whatever, but I mean, it doesn't. I, I don't know what happened. If it changed. You know, you'd have to. Yeah, you'd have to reoffer. Yeah, Justin Brady. I, I'm just really I, that sort of makes some sense, but it's a sort of implicit API that we're saying like debungle or bungle these things based on something that's not just about bungling. And like my main concern here is that we're going to need API service that's not as simple as a policy. You know, we've talked about well, you know, you can bungle audio and video separately, and like that makes some sense. But you know, Colin, Colin has also talked about. Um, you know, this sort of notion of, like, I want to send thumbnails in one bundle and main video in another bundle. And so, like, I think the API surface is going to be much more detailed here than any simple policy setting. So I, I think we could, you know, for the 1.0 set of things, we could still have a lot of things still to figure out in this. My general feeling is that we should just tolerate whatever we receive, but what we generate should be very simple. So we're, we cut the line. Sorry, I meant to say we cut the line, and I didn't want to interrupt him, but we're cutting the line at Peter. So the two of you who joined after Peter. Lo siento, amigos. Okay. Adam Roach, I'm mostly getting up to agree with Justin, I believe, where I think that right now we shouldn't worry too much about what the W3C will do for subsequent versions of this. And we should leave the door open for accepting those things, good, but not say anything more than that. Uh, Peter Thatcher, um, I was just going to point out that in the W3C world, this could all be solved, r not with a policy, but rather with um, RTP sender dot set transport, because then the JavaScript could do whatever it wants, arranging the different things. And if you were crazy, you could even make that fire on negotiate needed and have bundle groups appear. But um, it would be effectively one method that would be very flexible rather than a complicated policy. That's one possibility. Thank you. I, th I think the conclusion from the discussions, as far as we have a conclusion, is that this, uh, that the text in Dash 08 seems to say roughly what we wanted to say, but uh, that there's a huge amount of, uh, of uh, uncertainty and people need to go back and read JSEP and transport and bundle all at the same time and uh, suggest changes on lists. By the way, this uh, draft is now on GitHub. GitHub is a very pr fine place for suggesting text. I mean, many people have figured out how to suggest text on GitHub. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, so next slide. Oh, this is the next slide. Now, we're now on changes I have not made, but I want to. Or I want the group's advice on how to deal with this. There are two changes. One of, one of them is uh, whether we should re, uh, re, reference uh, Ben Schwartz's return document, which is corporate turn proxies. So, so we actually have the, that later in the um, meeting, the consideration of that, that draft? Um, I'm happy to, happy to leave it to take the conclusions from that discussion. Okay, and since we actually want to get to that draft, we have to speed up a little bit. So. Yeah. Um, for the next one, please raise. Yeah. Okay, next slide. Okay, SRP D TLS over ICE, five tuples. This is just after reading through the DTLS document and the DTLS SRTP document and seeing what text they used, I came up with the following uh, note to add to the text. Basically saying DTLS SRTP as defined in RFC 55764 defines protection of data carried over a single UDP source and destination port pair. In the context of using ICE, the term single UDP source and destination port pair needs to be understood as a single ICE component as defined in RFC 5245. Just anybody. So um, 5763 is actually very clear and explicit about how this stuff is supposed to work. And it says it's actually the right thing. 5764 has a little bit of ambiguous text, but really 5764 doesn't talk about ICE at all. Um, that's, the, that's the bad thing about it, yes. Yeah, I mean, but I, you know, I think the main thing is like, you just say, look at what 5763, um, I forget what the section number is, but it says exactly how this should be handled. Um, you know, instead of talking about 5764 even at all. Um, I'm actually, I have some slides for M Music tomorrow that's gonna talk about this uh, specifically. Okay, can you send text? Uh, yeah, absolutely. What Justin said in addition, right, realize single ice component is only one side of it, and if you have forking, this doesn't work. So forking? Well, that, if you have forking, then you have multiple ice transports, right, we, all with the same component, because the component only refers to the offer, right? No, components are... It's only one side. Uh, at the transport level, components uh, are, are scoped by the, by the ice connection. By the ice, uh, well, you, you, 5245, you if you look at the definition of component, it's like one, it just refers to one a candidate. Oh, if you, if you connect to two different places, uh, they have two different components. Okay. Hmm. Keith? Oh, yeah. That's it. Okay. And that's all we have. Sure. I mean, uh, Ecker, if you tell me where to send text, I can send text. And until we have a change in the reference, I, will, I, I would like to keep the te this text here. Okay. So, so Keith Drage here, I just wanted to express a concern that you're inviting the entire IETF discussion apparently to go to GitHub when the official means of communication is the IETF list or the list for this working group. So at least issues of a discussion nature should make their way in some form to the RTC web working group list, not just hide on GitHub. Yes. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Text suggestions are good on GitHub. And it also yes. is a, is a yes. tool I use to keep track of what I remember from the mailing list. So, so text but yes, discussion on the mailing list. Yes. And you can suggest on the mailing list as well, but the discussion will remain on the mailing list yep. no matter where the text suggestions are made. All right, Ben, you're up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Schwartz, and we are short on time. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. These slides are going to look really familiar to a lot of people. Uh, so return five is the same as return four, but it's got new figures. It's a little bit easier to understand. It's a little bit clearer, and it has this nice extra discussion about uh, handling these multi-tenant cloud turn servers, which is an interesting use case. And thanks very much to Alan Johnston and John Yoakum, who did a very detailed, thorough review uh, to help with this. Next. Okay, so this is the same as always. The turn server is normally configured by the web page, but with this argument to RTC peer connection, 
uh, and then you get your relay candidates, and there's lots of good reasons why you might want to use a turn server if you're in an application. Uh, but, uh, oh, and it looks like this. This is just, this should look familiar. Uh, you get a host candidate, maybe you get a server reflexive candidate, maybe you get a relay candidate from the turn server, uh, you speak different protocols to them. So, uh, we actually have this requirement in what is now actually an RFC that uh, the enterprise turn servers have to be somehow integrated into WebRTC, but we've never actually clarified how they're integrated. Return is designed to pin down exactly what it is that you're supposed to do if you happen to find yourself with an enterprise turn server. So, we have, uh, this is, uh, these figures are, are basically Alan, uh, Alan's figures adapted from, from ASCII art format into slide format. So, suppose that you had a turn server that was somehow in the, basically in the DMZ. We'll call this a border turn server. It's, it's somehow associated with your network border stuff. Um, then you could get a candidate on it, potentially, if you knew about it. And uh, it's marked as, I've marked it here as a, a border candidate. Um, we've somehow gotten it from this turn server, but next slide. Uh, we don't uh, know what to do with it. But we might really want to use it, because in some cases, uh, the firewall will actually block all of the traffic that you wanted to use to the application turn server, for example, or uh, to use the server reflexive. So uh, on those networks where the where the network operator has blocked UDP in general, but has has allowed it to authorize users uh, via the enterprise turn server, uh, maybe for quality of service reasons, who knows? Um, we would like to be able to use that candidate. So, but to do that, we need we need some idea on what to do with it. Uh, currently, we can't even assign it a type because uh, we don't have any standards to define how to handle such a thing. So that's return. Uh, so return explains that what you're supposed to do if you get uh, a candidate off of some enterprise turn server um, is that that candidate actually should act like a virtual network interface. Uh, so to be clear, this is not just taking that turn server and dumping it into the list of turn servers along with the application turn server. Instead, uh, it's a little bit like a VPN. It's a lot like a proxy. So next slide. So if you, uh, if you think of that as a proxy, then what you actually want to do is you want to open that port and treat it as a host port on a new virtual interface represented by that turn server. You might even want to do stun over that interface, although in most cases that's actually redundant. You don't really want to do that. Um, but maybe you do it and you just, it's irrelevant, doesn't hurt. Uh, and you, most importantly, want to connect through to the application provided turn server in case the application really needs you to be running through that turn server. For example, because it's trying to hide your identity from the other person that you're talking to. Or again, for quality of service or routing control reasons. Uh, in order to do this, you need a double turn connection. You're actually tunneling a turn connection to the application turn server through the enterprise turn server. And as there's no problem with that. That doesn't require any change to turn. It just is a strategy that the client needs to use if it finds itself in this case. Next. So uh, we call this a proxy. It's very analogous to the classic kind of web proxies that we're used to. I'm not talking about the like awful inline proxies that are messing with your traffic. I'm talking about the auto-discovered proxies, like the things that you find in the web proxy auto-discovery protocol, which has been around since 1999, or the things that the user configures through their operating system or something. Uh, OK, next. So, uh, right, so like this is what an HTTP, HTTP proxy looks like. It lives in the DMZ. You somehow find out about it through some auto discovery protocol. Your traffic is actually addressed to that proxy and you speak some protocol to it to make it make connections on your behalf. And that's exactly what we're talking about here for turn. The only difference is TCP versus UDP, basically. Uh, so there's one interesting case that, uh, that Alan and John found while we were talking about this. What if, hypothetically, your application were, uh, had a contract with a cloud turn server provider that was providing their turn server and wanted all traffic to go through it, demanded that all traffic go through it, and your enterprise network that you were on also had a contract with the same enterprise, uh, same cloud turn server provider and also demanded that all traffic go through that. Do you have to go through once or do you have to go through twice? Uh, that's right. I guess you could do other interesting things. So, 
So uh, we thought about this and decided that you actually, next slide, you actually do have to go through twice. Uh, and the reason that you have to go through twice is that the uh, potentially the authorization uh, is independent for these two things. And you can imagine, for example, a cloud provider giving statistics back to the uh, back to the people who are paying for the traffic. So uh, those statistics could easily include the IP addresses that are being used to connect. And so essentially to preserve, uh, preserve user privacy and get correct billing, um, you, you need to connect twice as if the certain turn server is independent. But if we can come up with a way to avoid this safely in the future in cases where the authorization or the origin attributes work right, then we don't have to do it. Yeah, Martin Thompson, I think, it's, I, I think this is an okay conclusion. If this turn server wants to do something special so that it doesn't have to send packets to itself, just realize that these two things are the same internally and optimize that out, that's fine. Right. Um, so I think that anybody who deploys cloud turn server should be really excited about this conclusion. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what you're referring to. Anyway, um, okay, so in conclusion, return hasn't changed. It still gives us precise, uh, precise description of, of how we're supposed to meet our requirements that are already documented, uh, but now we have nicer figures and hopefully it's all a little bit clearer. So, so Colin Chase, I asked on the list, but one of the questions was about how we discover these. And I think that this has huge security implications on what the answer is. That I think we definitely need to answer that fairly concretely. Sure, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. So what's the answer? The answer is, uh, the, the answer is, I think it's actually out of scope. Uh, I think it's irrelevant. And so, so tram I, auto discovery. I, okay, so I, I, I do not think it's possible to analyze the security properties of these and more specifically whether this is gonna be used to man and middle my traffic, which is a major concern in the security, in analysis of security documents at IETF. And so I, I do not want us, I think that that issue needs to be answered in a concrete way in the documents before I can decide whether I think that we should reference this document or not. This document right. cannot and will not include the auto discovery or discovery mechanisms because the TRAM working group owns that. Uh, it's fine for it to reference the TRAM working group. I'm not saying it has to be done, you know, this, it, when you, you're sorry, you just said that you won't reference the... the no, no, the it can't, yeah, I mean, right. it can't... It wouldn't be in this document yeah. is what you mean. Yeah. yeah okay, okay. Uh, so, like, you know, the methods they're proposing over there right now would be a big security problem for us. And it'd be much worse than the stuff we were talking about with split VPNs a minute ago, right? So... If they allow anyone to take an out of, you know, to take an attack and move it over, right? Yeah, but this is exactly parallel to a long-standing and universally deployed system. No, it's not. It's not the same as the pack files. Yeah, I think it's exactly the same as pack files. You want to say something about Long-standing bang equal well below. <laughs> so I, I think we could talk. I think we could talk about you know how auto discovery works in the context of the security documents. But as Ben says, this is really orthogonal to that. This is saying if we find one of these things, here's what we do with it. I think we should treat that separately and decide as a working group if we, if, if we find one of these things, is this the right way to handle it? So I'm, I'm pretty categorically also against putting in something that may allow random people at the Starbucks to man in the middle of all my traffic. Um, now, the proxy.pack file is somewhat different. If we said that that was going to be the method we used for this, and we also described my next second question, which is how do we get the credentials to use these servers, which I got a complete blow-off answer of, oh, you just use the enterprise credentials. I mean, like, like, how does that really work in practice? We're going to need a lot more specific than that. I guess we can keep going, but we are over time. Uh, Alan Johnson, so this is really just about how we can get two turn servers in a given, uh, into a single candidate effectively and make it work. And we need that to happen. Otherwise, when we get behind an enterprise system, WebRTC is not going to work very well. And this is the solution for that. And if there are security issues, we need to work through some of those. But I'll also point out that this is for cases where people control the network. So if you're talking about being able to route packets through a turn server, you know, in an enterprise, they can do anything they want to your packets. So it, there's really no difference there at all. Uh, Ted Hardy, uh, first, they can't do anything they want to my packets. They can drop them at any, at any moment, but not at anything. Can you go to the slide that shows the double turn? That one? No, uh, keep going back. That there, one. We, there we go. 
so as I understand it, the border turn proxy, there's a, there's a, a now invisible dot that represents the uh, border turn proxy, which is now forwarding the, um, the traffic through to the turn server in the cloud. Is, is that correct? Okay, so it's like a minuscule dot missing, missing there. And the theory is that in this case, uh, the relay two candidate is turn in turn, right? And so how is it that the um, browser and application context know that they are to generate turn in turn? The application, uh, depending on your definition, uh, in, in the JavaScript sense, is not uh, sorry. None of this uh, you're is quite correct. I apologize. That was uh, I meant the, the the browser or mobile application using a uh, browser substrate. Sorry sure. about that. So uh, the answer is that it uh, it's up to the browser to determine what is a trustworthy mechanism of accepting a turn configuration. For example, you could imagine uh, an a, a registry setting that allows an enterprise to just exactly the same as proxy configuration to set an operating system setting uh, that, that adds a turn proxy alongside its HTTP proxy so that UDP traffic can exit the network in the same way that allows uh, TCP traffic to exit the network through that HTTP proxy. So in mobile devices then, um, am I to understand that in a mobile device this OS setting would be present at all times? Uh, the Android I, I'm aware of Android. Android has a user-controlled operating system setting for setting an HTTP or SOX proxy. Uh, it's got a GUI. Uh, and it would be, in that case, up to the user to set that. Okay. Um, so I, I imagine most cases you wouldn't want to use the same proxy at all times. I think that's probably what you're getting at, you know, and I think that this would probably be discovered from the network via pack or, you know, some similar type of mechanism. So given, given that, there, let's assume that there's a case here where um, the, so there are, there are a number of fragilities in introducing this in, a, in addition to the potential optimization. So as I understand it, you, you, you believe that there are going to be enough cases here where the NAT firewall will simply block the UDP outbound traffic unless it's going to a turn server, that RTC will have no effective candidates because it won't even be able, able to reach the turn server in the cloud, much less be able uh, to send direct connect. So I understand that that's, the, that's the, 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 the motivating example here. I think the problem I, I'm having, in a, and I think maybe a generalization of the problem that, that Colin raised, is you, you can't solve that case by introducing fragility into other cases. And so I'm a bit worried about the case where somebody who um, has such a, a setting starts to send turn and turn to the turn server in the cloud, which then goes, I have no idea where to send the turn inside this. Um, and I, I don't follow. It's, it's uh, not, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bold <laughs> words, Justin. It's, yeah, it's, it's never it's, ambiguous. It's or never or ambiguous. Or the or application or. provides a set of turn servers. Those are the terminal turn servers. As far as the application is concerned, the, that's, where the, that's where the application data is exiting. But, so I, I do think about the web, the web proxy, but there are two different kinds of web proxy, and there's a web proxy where you actually expect the proxy itself to behave according to a set of rules, and, there's an app, and there is a web proxy where what you expect is that it, it's told to connect and it's a pass-through for certain kinds of traffic. And what I'm hearing you say is actually that you expect turn in turn here, which implies to me that the one element of this term will be interpreted by that proxy before being passed on. That's not the same as what happens in a connect. And in a connect, it's simply you issue something in the beginning and it passes through from that point on so without decapsulation, without anything. The exact so, protocol used for HTTP connect is indeed substantially different. And if you're looking for a protocol analogy, it's much closer to SOX. I, I think that we need some more discussion on the list. Uh, speaking as an individual and not as chair, I think we need some more discussion on the list. This seems like a great beer topic as well upstairs. I mean, could we try to take a consensus call? Or I feel like we've talked about this now for two IETFs, and, you know, there's not been much misdiscussion at all. So I feel like a lot of people have been following this pretty closely, and I feel like, you know, we'll be ready to make a decision here. 
decision to adopt it as a working group item. Yes. All right, I'm willing to do that now. Um, yeah. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I, I, uh, all right, so let's do a hum. All right, since we're a little over time, we're going to have to confirm this on the list, obviously. All those in favor of adopting the draft, please hum now. Okay, stop. All those that oppose adopting this draft, please hum now. It's pretty rough, but I think good enough to pull in. So we obviously have to confirm that on the list, though. So I, I formally object to adopting that draft without enough time to actually discuss or get answers to well, any of the security that's, questions that's that are raised. That's why we have okay, to take okay, it to the so, list, Colin. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, uh, I'll take, take the, the roughness of the hammer and the continued discussion as a direction not to insert any, anything in the transport draft at this time. <laughs> 